Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so when we were starting our business, it was kind of hard to explain to our friends what it was that we were doing. Um, and one day I'm scrolling through my Instagram feed and I see a meme. It says this. My friends say, I never see you at the club. And I say, I never see you at the bank. <laughs> yeah. and, and I love the fact that you all get this, but it was really kind of that way of explaining to my community what we were doing. And so I was finally like, okay, now I can, I can use this kind of comical way to explain to my community what we were doing. And uh, I decided to go out and post it in a rather large Facebook group. So I go out there and I post it. And of course I'm expecting the kind of conversation around saving versus spending and you know, planning for the future, all that. And there was a little bit of that. But it was amazing to me there was this whole sidebar conversation going on around what is a bank? Who uses cash anymore? Who goes to the bank? And then there were others who were like, I go to the bank all the time. My mother-in-law goes to the bank every single week. There are some people who go to the bank every single day because they have cash from business, right? They need to make those deposits. So that's kind of why we're here today. We're kind of here to talk about this whole gamut of all these different people that banking and those of us in the personal finance space that we serve. That's what our discussion is going to be about today. So we have three panelists today with us uh, from Capital One. I'll Go ahead and introduce them by name, but they are going to do a lot better job of introducing themselves to you. So uh, we'll start here on the end with Steph Hay, then John Durant, and Jennifer Winbeck. So Steph, do you mind kicking us off? Give us a little bit of a, a history of yourself with Capital One yeah. and what you do. Sure. I'm uh, Vice President of Design for Conversational AI, which is our Alexa, Cortana, and Eno, our gender neutral uh, personal assistant, um, and also integrated experiences, which is largely about uh, how we use data to connect different experiences across the consumer channels that we serve. And uh, I really joined Capital One, I was um, uh, telling stories beforehand, uh, really serendipitously, um, a little bit more than four years ago after working for myself for, for about five years as a freelance writer, and I had a couple startups along the way. and. Um, I really had no expectation that a company would ever hire a journalist, um, but uh, one that was all about being a bank and ledgers and uh, that was not going to be me and I wouldn't be able to be myself in a place like that and I was totally wrong, uh, but it um, was, was really fantastic that about four years ago I met uh, one of the folks who um, is no longer at Capital One but was at the uh, leading the design team at the at the time and said we're really changing the way that people interact with money and would you like to do that and I said hell yeah so uh, <laughs> if I'm being honest I was like hell yeah and uh, <laughs> did I do that and um, he said let's let's give it a shot so uh, four years later I'm still here and doing some pretty uh, remarkable things to uh, really transform how people interact with their money so I'm excited to be here too so thanks thank you Steph John uh, well, thank you everybody. My name is John Durant. Uh, I lead what we call product and operations in the bank at Capital One. Uh, so that includes our digital experiences, the core uh, checking, savings, CD type products. Uh, and then operations is uh, sort of what it sounds like, a whole bunch of various things that we do to serve our customers. Um, I've spent, uh, unlike Steph, I've spent my whole career actually in financial services. Uh, I'm, uh, I grew up actually in Orlando, Florida, so coming back here was, was kind of nice. My parents were small business owners. I really didn't grow up thinking that I would go into corporate America. Uh, I, I spent 25 years in corporate America. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure, exactly sure how it happened, but I will say that throughout those 25 years, I've always gravitated towards um, sort of more entrepreneurial and, uh, and turnaround type, type, type roles. And you know, I was, I was really drawn to Capital One about seven years ago. Uh, because it is, it is a company that really does take a, a unique view towards money and finances and banking. I've worked at four other banks, uh, I can say with, re with relative confidence that, uh, <laughs> that it's a pretty unique place and it's a platform that, uh, that I get to take advantage of every day as we, as Steph said, look to, look to really change banking for good. It's something that we use internally as a, as a slogan quite a bit and, uh, and it really does come out in our, in our people and in the work that we do every day. That's great. And I am Jennifer Windbeck, and I am a recovering banker. So I, uh, <laughs> much like John, after uh, 
<laughs> After a couple decades of, uh, of traditional banking and everything from uh, roles in branch banking and business banking, private banking and mortgage banking, about four years ago, I had the opportunity at Capital One to begin working with our Capital One cafes and uh, still have the pleasure of doing that um, where we're, we are reimagining and rethinking how do people interact with banks and banking services and money in a, in a physical way. And then I also get the opportunity to do that with our Capital One branches. So now that we are beginning to think about how can the branch banking experience also be different, um, get to work with both of those groups. All right. So um, last April, uh, we were, my husband and I were, John, were attending uh, another financial services conference. And uh, we were part of a whole discussion around uh, what it is that those of us who in this room who are in the personal finance space uh, or our financial journalists, what can we do to better connect our community with products and services that are appropriate for them? So as we're having our discussion, our panel discussion, if you don't mind, I'd like to maybe have you think about that. And I'll get a couple of comments from you as a group. What, what is it that we can do better to serve the community that we want to help improve their lives? So we'll go ahead and get into our panel discussion here. So our first question here is, what are the top things customers are demanding from banks to enhance their banking experience? When we think about this whole idea of all these different people and their different ways of interfacing with banks. All right, uh, I'll take it. Um, you know, I think most, most consumers and customers uh, want pretty basic stuff. They're, they're not looking for, uh, you know, whiz-bang things. They're, they're looking for, you know, really good service, the ease and convenience of basic transactions, getting money into their account, getting money out of their account, using their credit card or their debit card. Um, and by and large, when you go and talk to consumers, it, it usually takes a while to get them to even think about the answer to that question. Because right. most people would rather their banking and their money be in the background so they can live their life. Right. Um, and, and by and large, they, they, they tend to, the first thing they think of is the times where things went kind of off the rails, right? Like off the, the happy path. Right. Um, and they'll say things like, well, I wish that you would just fix this when it goes wrong better. Right. So the first thing that comes to mind when I hear, I hear the question is, kind of just get, like, get the basics right all the time. Right. And unfortunately, uh, I think over the years, for a whole host of reasons, uh, some, some legitimate reasons, things like you know, protecting consumers from fraud and those sort of things, and some because uh, banks have grown to be you know, really complex in many ways, and money is, is going to be very complex. Unfortunately, I, think, um, I, don't, I don't think everyone's experience is, is that, is, is sort of the happy path. So the first thing that I, I, I tend to think about when I hear that question is, is sort of get the basics right. You know, make it so that when I want to put money into the account, it's there, it's available, right? That's probably a very common piece of feedback that we get is, um, is you know, holds on my deposits cause real interruption in my life. Yeah. Um, or when you decline transactions, oftentimes, almost always, because we're looking to protect from fraud, um, you know, that's a real disruption in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I, I think, Big life events are the other thing that come up when you talk to customers. Um, whether it's getting married, having a baby, moving, graduating college, saving for kids, like you know, they, there are, I think there are those moments that matter in life, right. and in those moments they want they want someone or or some they want their bank to be there for them to help them with everything from actual like expertise and advice on on the moment itself. But obviously, that's wrapped around like how do how does that impact my money and my finances and yeah. um, and so I think I think those are the two things I think it's really like get the basics right. Let me get my money in and get my money out. With you know, I'd like to, I'd love it all to be in the background kind mm -hmm. of thing and, and to work. And then when when I need you because it's a big deal, it's a big moment in my life. Uh, come with expertise and advice. I find personally that most people intuitively know what they should do, but oftentimes they're looking for a company to validate what's, what's kind of intuitive to them. Right. Yeah, I was having a conversation with uh, someone earlier today, and, uh, and she said, you know, those of us who are here working in the financial services space or, or, or personal finance professionals, we're weird. <laughs> we really are weird. We think about money all the time, you know, and, and, and we sometimes think, well, that's what everybody else does too, right. and they absolutely don't no. do that, right? They want to think about it as little as possible, no. and they kind of expect 
yeah. that things just work out the way that they want them to work out. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's a mutually beneficial relationship in that way because we right. we are thinking about money all the time to take care of our customers right. so that they don't have to think about it. And that's I think the expectations have shifted tremendously when you've got Amazon sending drones on a mountaintop to deliver a package within two hours. <laughs> and you're like, sorry, we can't get back to you for four days. It's not acceptable, <laughs> right? And so we should be paying attention all the time. We should be available all the time. And I think there's also now a shift, especially with the more personalized experiences that you get when I remember when Netflix took away the ability to rate something there was like anarchy at first right <laughs> because because now Netflix is paying attention to the data and starting to make inferences about the way you want to consume the content rather than asking you to give them all the information so that then they can give you a better experience and so if we're paying attention to that kind of money and being able to help reassure customers in these moments that matter so there's a life bump or fraud happens on your account, you better believe we are on top of it and we are reaching out with more information than you might normally want from us while you're backgrounded because it's not a normal use case. It's something where there's higher emotion and we've thought about that and we're giving you a little bit extra to help you feel better. So it's that immediacy and that feeling, the personalization, our ability to use the data and pay attention to it, obsess over all the data that we have that's gonna make really compelling customer experiences. Yeah, definitely. I think that there's, there's so much going on in, in this space, but there are a lot of people who want it really simple. They just still just want to walk into a bank, take care of their transaction, and leave. So how do we service that kind of group? We, we definitely still have those customers. And what we're hearing from customers is most people are preferring to bank digitally most of the time. There are some who prefer the convenience and the regularity of day-to-day of -day banking. But in those, in those moments that matter, that's when they really want to be able to connect with someone on a human level. So to be able to go into a branch and to talk to someone or to go into a cafe and, and get that reassurance. Um, even people who never do it, but just to know that, that there is a location nearby that they could go to, mm -hmm. that that's increasingly important to customers. Um, we certainly have our more traditional customers who prefer you know, prefer the human touch, and we find ways to, to uh, help them with that. But I think there's this need for education and a desire for education of those customers, too, where there's just this one step of fear that we have to get them past to help them to see that there are more convenient ways to bank. Right, exactly. So what's that experience like a little bit? Maybe you can clue us in on We have, um, I'd say there are some formal ways that we do it and then informal ways. So the biggest thing that we're doing in the cafes is trying to have, like, a great human experience with customers. and really relate to people the way that they want to interact with us. Um, for our branch banking customers who have opted into branch banking and, and prefer that type of experience, we have programs like Ready, Set, Bank is an example where we will offer seminars um, to seniors that are geared, geared towards seniors in particular to show them not even just Capital One digital topics, but ways to use the internet and ways to use mobile devices to access things. Um, and then that does also include certainly our banking products. To provide that one-on-one -on -one experience with someone of let me show you, let me teach you how to do it. Um, and at the same time, we're still providing cash services for the customers in the way they want, but also helping to equip them better outside of the bank. So there's, there's all these different ways that we can connect. Now, I heard this term for the first time preparing for this, uh, channel proliferation. <laughs> what does that mean? And, and what, why does it matter? What, what, what is it that banks, why do banks need to to be concerned about that idea of? Yeah, well, uh, I think the, the jury's still out on how concerned, <laughs> but I think, I think there's some things that are pretty clear. So if you take a sort of big step back, right, like there, over the course of like 50 years, yeah, ban branches existed, have existed for a very long time, and then ATMs became sort of a, a, a new technology. And, and actually, if you, there, there are articles, there are really good articles you can find. If you go back and, and sort of and look in the annals of when ATMs came out, when ATMs Just came out, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good time. Um, <laughs> people were writing about the death of the branch. The branches were going to go away because ATMs were going to take care of everything mm. for consumers. Um, and then, you know, the internet became a thing, obviously, late 90s, early 2000s. Some of the same exact articles uh, started, be, you know, started being written, and, and the, you know, the prognosticators sort of forecasting that branches were going to go away. And by the way, during that entire 40 years, branches just kept going up in the United States. Um, it is only in the last 10 years 
that branches have actually started coming down. The sheer number of branches in the US are, are decreasing. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that it's been the last 10 years that mobile banking is, is, is prevalent and, um, and, and is increasingly you know, the, the way that many customers solely interact with their bank um, and lots of customers interact with, with mobile. So I, I think that channel proliferation is like the definition is just you know, more and more and more channels. Historically, what that really led to was more and more and more interactions, but not really replacing the prior types of interactions. Mobile and remote deposit capture are really the first time that you've started to see um, a channel, a new channel, replace prior interactions. Um, and I think that's meaningful. And I think we're, I mean, I think we're just in the beginning of, of recognizing how mobile technology and some of the things that are coming around AI and these sort of things um, can actually begin to continue to replace historical interactions. So why do banks have to care? I think they have to pay, pay very close attention to uh, whether or not some of those historical interactions and historical channels continue to be like the, the channel of choice for consumers. Right. Yeah, definitely paying attention to what our consumers or what our audience wants. That's a, you know, why, why we're here is to help our audience perform better or, or have a better financial life. Um, so, Steph, you mentioned earlier this whole idea of AI, which yeah. I think for some, especially some of our readers, kind of freaks them out. They get a little scared with this whole idea. <laughs> so, so what it, explain again a little bit more of what, uh, what uh, Capital One is doing. Yeah, so it, it kind of dovetails nicely in this idea of, of channel proliferation because um, each of these touch points really enables us to understand how customers want to interact and to continue personalizing the experiences so that they start to feel more like the bank that's in your pocket or the bank that's in your house talking to you or in the car when you're at the light and you see the car next to you and you're like, that car's cool, can I afford that car? And you ask your bank, that will happen. <laughs> We're not there yet, but uh, being able to have uh, that amount of data and um, machines paying attention to that amount of data and the behavioral patterns that are happening enables us to uh, create much more contextually relevant experiences for our customers. So we started uh, experimenting in this space with Eno, which is um, our gender neutral uh, chatbot, which we announced at South by Southwest last year, about a year and a half ago. Um, and this was really, we decided to start initially by having Eno uh, available in SMS because it was the most ubiquitous channel. So uh, people, 98% of people who have smartphones text on a regular basis, so the behavior is known as well. And uh, now you can text with your bank 24-7 uh, via Eno to ask about your balance, to be able to pay your bill, uh, get a joke maybe. They're bad puns, I gotta tell you. But uh, I'm proud of them, but uh, they're bad. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, so this is, uh, and, and this was really because uh, you know, Amazon, uh, Google with Google Assistant, Facebook with M, they already started getting into these spaces to really understand uh, what they could do with the data, uh, being able to serve up much more nuanced experiences for customers when they're looking at patterns across just an, like an enormous amount of data that no human would be able to parse and really make sense of at any sort of time to really be competitive. So, uh, so we had uh, experimented with the uh, Amazon Alexa skill. We're um, still in market with that. Now we're on Cortana as well so that you can bank in those channels and then now with Eno scaling into additional channels into the mobile app uh, we're just continuing to find ways to create something that feels like a really personalized experience with uh, what we hope will become a real trustworthy personal assistant for customers uh, that can be pervasive throughout every channel. It's so it, it's very um, exciting but I think for a lot of people it's also very uh, they're very hesitant so you need to kind of have that right match that kind of fit for them. Yeah. Um, I, I like that the, you brought up this idea of it's a gender neutral platform. Yeah. You know, we reach a huge audience. You, just even the people here in this room, we reach millions of people every day. And I think, Rosemary, you have a massive audience and 95% of them are women, right? And Eric, I think you're, you know, you, the publications that you write for, maybe some of those may skew more towards men. And so we have this, we have this kind of balance that we have to, to take when we're talking to our audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to do that with, uh, you know, I think Siri, Cortana, That's right. you know, you, 
kind of see these. You hear a pattern here, right? Don't we? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the, what's the the this, Eno gender yeah. neutral? Um, I the story is I uh, when we first started talking about creating an AI for the company, I said, well, absolutely has to be a man because there's no way that we would be able to just follow suit and choose female assistant. Uh, uh, we bucked the trend. We're going to do. And then I talked to uh, who is now the head of conversational AI design, uh, named, a woman named Audra Coakley's Plummer. And she came out of Pixar. And she came out of Lucasfilm. She worked on Shrek and Ratatouille. And she had done character development. And I was interviewing her. Um, and she was in Berkeley. And I was in DC. And I said, hey, what do you think about you know, gendered uh, assistants? And what's your thoughts on that? And I said, uh, and I told her exactly what I just told you. And she goes, oh, that's interesting. She goes, well, I wouldn't necessarily want to reinforce existing stereotypes that all assistants are women, but I also wouldn't want to reinforce that men manage money. And so I was like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't win. <laughs> Thought I had this. Uh, and I said, please come work here. So, uh, so fortunately she did. And of all the things that we A-B test as a very analytical company, this was not one of them. This was a choice that we made to, of course, we're going to run into all of the challenges, like what is the Eno's voice going to be? And what's Eno going to look like when, uh, when we animate Eno or we ever need to add uh, a visual to Eno that doesn't exist? Today? We said, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But that was really important to not pull forward into that interaction that our customers are having with the AI, any existing, um, uh, any, any sort of existing uh, uh, relationships that people might have. With, um, with gender, just took the variable out of it. Very interesting. Is there an option? Can I select? <laughs> no. <laughs> nice. OK. That's the way it's going to be. <laughs> For now. For right? now. Exactly. All right, so um, when we think about all of these issues that banks are facing, what would you say are some of the most challenging right now? Is it, is it the technology that people are trying to consume, or is it the fact that maybe some of the services that they're used to may be changing into something different? What, what is it that banks are challenged with, and maybe that we as an audience can think about addressing some of those issues? I do think technology is at the top of every bank CEO's mind. Um, it is an industry that's been obviously been around for a very long time, and uh, there is you know in the in the technology world there's this term tech debt right when you sort of have something have a system that's been around for a long time, and you wanna you wanna do something new and different, but before you can do that something new and different you have to go pay down the tech debt you have to fix the thing that you have. Yeah. Well, I think it's fair to like describe the banking industry as like one enormous pile of tech debt. <laughs> um, <laughs> It is, uh, it is, it is mind-boggling how uh, large and complex the legacy technology systems are that power the you know, the bigger banks in the United States. Um, and so, you know, it's it's one of the things that I've I've just come to realize and appreciate is, in some ways, it's so much easier to start from a blank sheet of paper, and build something on the cloud. And you know, just if you start with nothing and build with with technologies that are that are up to date. Um, you can do it so much faster yeah. than if you're dealing with that with that technology debt. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, banks have large amounts of resources and lots of customers, and uh, and so there's there's a competing uh, sort of a competing dynamic there. But I, I do think that technology is um, one of the top two or three things that that banks in general struggle with, and and in particular, if you look at the sort of banking landscape. Um, you've got three really large national banks, um, and it's hard to get your head around the scale of those banks versus all other banks. Uh, you know, we have thousands of banks in the United States, but the you know the top three are are really they really have a different type of scale than the rest of the banks, and that affords them budgets to deal with this tech debt. That um, you know, even players that are household names in many of the geographies in the U.S. are, are struggling to keep up. So. I am. I personally, sort of looking inside of the bank, at least, not thinking about customers and what they're, you know, what, what they're struggling with. There's a whole other conversation, and there's some real content there. I do think technology is probably the number one challenge for most banks right now. I think in the physical setting, the the tech issue shows up most for small businesses. That 
we have great ways actually to handle cash needs for consumers now, but as we have, you know, reducing branches across many banks and, uh, and we're seeing consumers adopt more digital formats, we've you know, yet to come up with great solutions for small business owners yeah. and handling their day-to-day -day cash needs. So yeah. that's one on my mind. I think what's also with the technology, and, and maybe the reason why so many people still go into a branch bank is there's, there's an ever-increasing worry about fraud or my digital information and protecting that. How are we addressing that, or how can we, how can we reassure people that, yeah, you can enter your account number and plug in your password and, and connect your bank to a product or service or connect them so that your bills can be paid automatically, those kinds of things. How do we reassure them with something like that? Yeah, it, it is, uh, yeah, so fraud is one of the things that we include in our operations team at the bank and, and I personally spend a lot of time uh, with that team. Uh, I think to get directly at your question, I think we've got to continue to communicate with customers. And I think uh, we're having actually quite a bit of success getting, once we can get customers to try, you know, try mobile banking, what, what happens is they get used to receiving either text messages or notifications. And to me, I, I, think, I think probably um, the thing that, that m the biggest opportunity to, to get customers comfortable with this is to get them to try mobile banking. Because once someone tries mobile banking, we know so much more about them because that phone itself actually gives us a lot of very unique information mm -hmm. that helps us validate that they are who they are, they're, you know, and they're the ones doing the transaction. We can, we, can, we can actually protect them much better if they're engaged in mobile banking, and we can communicate with them. Right? I mean, there, yeah, there, there's, you're, what, you're, what you're most afraid of is someone stealing your, you know, hacking into your account. Right. Um, and there's no better way for us to actually protect customers than to talk to them or communicate with them through the mobile device. And, and I think for many people, that's kind of maybe a, I, I don't necessarily understand that. Why is it that doing something digitally is yeah. more, is safer for me on yeah. my phone than going into the branch? So we right. need to figure out how do, we, how do we help people get to that point like, oh yeah, I can, I can do this and it's, it's, it's safer for me because you know more about yeah. me, you understand who I am. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's an, thinking about the immediacy element too, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we ended up moving our fraud notifications for credit cards um, from, a, from an SMS alert that required the customer to type back very strict terms, confirm or deny. If you didn't give us one of those two terms, we did not understand what you were saying to us. And so we moved that to using, using the same technology, right? We, we moved it to a technology platform where we could, uh, Eno's brain being able to understand natural language and went from 85% of folks being able to or being able to understand about 85% to being able to understand 99%, okay. and and that was in a matter of weeks. And and that and that's because people in those moments, those heightened moments, um, they of course they don't trust the technology when when something happens that doesn't allow them to get over what is the emotional moment that they're feeling right now. So they would say, we would say confirm or deny, and they would say no 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 it's not me. And we're like, sorry. <laughs> we don't know what you're saying to us. You know, like, it always comes back to trust. Yes. So um, if, there's, if we're able to use this, the same technology to reach them through, through mobile, I think is absolutely what John's saying, the, the, the key. It's in everybody's pocket right now. Um, and being able to tailor the communications to really understand where they're at in that moment so that it speaks to them and doesn't sound like something that is, uh, you know, n not natural to them, then uh, we kind of break down some of the fear just by being able to be relational in those moments. Definitely. Yeah, one other thought, I, I, one of the things we tell customers all the time is, because um, yeah, part of this is just being honest about the environment that we live in, right? Yeah. The reality is that there are, there, there are organized fraud communities that are as active as they've ever been. I mean, I've, as I've, I've acknowledged I've been in, in this business longer than I want to admit. Like it's. It's, there's no question that fraud is as prevalent and uh, the, the attacks are more prevalent than they've ever been. Um, and so there is an element of take, you know, pay attention, right? So I know that it's, it's tempting to say, I really want it all to be in the background, which is, I think, what most people really want. Uh, but it, you know, I think the fact that you can, within five seconds, yeah. log into your phone and just take a quick look at the transactions yeah. is a pretty smart thing to do, right? And once a week at least, 
um, you know, take take two minutes and 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 log in and, and take a look. I mean, there's there's simple things consumers can do to protect themselves instead of having to wait to the middle of the month to get your statement yeah. and then check to see if, the if you're waiting for your statement. Accurate, right? no. I right. promise the fraudsters are a couple <laughs> steps ahead of you. Right, exactly. So you talked about a little bit about trust, and, and I think that that may be sometimes the reason why some people go into a bank. But at the same time, I think a lot of people are hesitant to go into a bank because there may be a perception of lack of trust because the person that's there doesn't necessarily have my best interests in, at mm -hmm. heart. They're trying to sell me a product. So what? Let's talk about that experience at the Capital One Cafe. How does how do we make how how does that make the experience better? That's exactly what we heard when we talked to consumers. Was yeah, you know, we're we're in an era where I think of, uh, some people had a visit to the bank somewhere between going to the dentist and the DMV, <laughs> and we wanted to change that. So we wanted it to be a place that you know perhaps people look forward to coming. Um, and so when when people go into a Capital One Cafe. We are very comfortable with customers coming in who are just there to have coffee or to use free Wi-Fi, to use the, uh, the facilities that we have. The associates don't have sales goals, and so we do train our, our Capital One ambassadors to be available to customers to help them and to talk to them, but, but not to try to sell them anything. And, and people are always waiting for the catch right. on that, so they're waiting for, you know, mm. for some sort of catch, and there, and there really isn't one. What we hope happens is that the customers who come in with that in mind, who are coming in just for coffee or to explore, see something that piques their interest. And so we do hope that at some point they talk to one of our ambassadors or they catch something digitally. And then on their own terms, they can kind of decide what they want. So we would have everything from the, from the range of um, digital interactive uh, content that the customer could use either on an iPad or on uh, larger digital screens to self-explore for customers who would prefer that. Um, our ambassadors who can certainly help with anything related to Capital One products or services if the customer uh, needs help with their accounts, um, all the way to money coaching services, which would be really one-on-one, -on -one, really personalized sessions helping to tie a customer's values to money and how they think about money. Um, and, and our money coaches actually cannot sell Capital One products. So it's you know truly something to help tie customers to money. Um, we have financial education. We have lots of fun things going in in the cafes too every day. So it's, it's really up to what the customer wants that experience to be. Right. I will give a shout out for the, the coaching because I actually went through that process. I, I, I did a, one of the sessions and it's so interesting that the coaching, you know, when you think about money coaching, everything's okay. You, you want to know what my balance is on my credit card and what my balance is on my bank account. And you want to know what my, how much I make and no numbers at all. And it mm -hmm. was just like, okay, this is, this is so different. And I think sometimes when you remove the numbers, people are much more comfortable talking about. It's about life. Yeah, these are the things like you had mentioned earlier, the, the life experiences right. are the ones that we need to be there oftentimes for. Yeah. So. It's, it's not unusual for people to cry. I think you mentioned you saw someone crying today, maybe today. So, you know, we have very emotional experiences. We have, we have some that aren't that intense too, so people shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be worried about it. But, you know, really deep, meaningful discussions um, with certified life coaches who can who can help people to tie that together. Because that is certainly a you know a continuing concern of Americans is feeling stressed about money and feeling not educated. And so we're tr we are seeking to help people understand their relationship with money and then put them in control. I think for a lot of us who connect with our audiences, that's that's something we're familiar with, right? We connect with an audience because we understand how they're feeling, or we write something and that connects with them. And it's not necessarily about the numbers. It's not, but it's more about how they're feeling about their relationship with money, which for for so many people, mm -hmm. that is not what a bank has been right. about for all right. their, you know most of their lives. It is not. That's not the experience mm -hmm. that I'm used to. Yeah. So. Now we'll go back to the technology side where maybe I won't have that high touch experience. How are the, the how's, you know, interacting, mm -hmm. how are people feeling about that interaction and maybe you can give us some idea of numbers yeah, or statistics. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so we've got millions of folks interacting with Eno and we've got uh, a few marriage proposals so far, <laughs> so that's pretty nice. Uh, it's really, it, it's exactly what you're saying about connecting. It, for us, there's a, uh, metric that we feel really uh, excited about when it's just the number of people who say thank you or they say I love you you know any sort of expression of gratitude or I've taken care of something for someone I mean they have this mental checklist of you know ten things that are going on at every time and Eno's taken care of two of them before they've even had to think about it we're doing something right yeah. 
And so some of the interactions, again, like a, it's all about immediacy, it's all about trust. It's this, uh, you know, we, um, you know, reaches out if there's a, a double swipe or if it looks like you tipped a little bit more than usual just to make sure that you meant to do that. And in most cases, people do. We're not telling people something that they don't know already or their subscription just went up. Um, uh, but it's the reassurance that some something, somebody is looking out for them. And it's exactly what you're talking about, which is that there's this partnership feeling then that they have not always had, right? Um, and it's starting to, in those moments, uh, because they arrive with some warmth, because they arrive at the time that is necessary, um, and because they're constructed by people um, who, who typically, I think, maybe um, they, they work in more social, social sciences kinds of capacities, like anthropologists are working on designing these experiences. People who are, who are um, folks who've worked with money and worked with people who've had real pain around money and have come out of debt and that sort of thing. Um, these are the folks who are behind these experiences, so therefore they're pulling some of that experience into, um, into the, the interaction itself. And that makes it feel different. And if we can achieve that and marry that with the technology and the data in, in the ways that are going to really meet the needs of our customers and maybe even surprise them a little bit with what, what care we're taking, then we're doing something right. Yeah, that sounds right. So, John, I'll kind of, I know you're kind of head of products, so you have to pull all this together. How, do, how, do, how does this happen? Mm -hmm. uh, very carefully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, some of it is, Obviously, you have, to be, you have to be cognizant of meeting people where they are, right? So you know, just numbers-wise, right? we have 8 million customers that bank with us, 50-plus million customers in total uh, for Capital One. And so there's lots of different types of customers, as we were talking about earlier. And it's a very tricky thing to, you know, you want to take care of every customer. Uh, banks have historically, I think, thought about products and channels through the lens of um, sort of give every customer what it is that they want in whatever channel they want it kind of kind of approach and you know I, I will own that I think at Capital One we're increasingly sort of take having a point of view around uh, building a point of view around you know down the road what's what is what do we think is the best way to deliver a product a service uh, a service experience and doing everything we can do to introduce customers to that to that point of view, and so you hear us talking a lot about um, some things that are still in you know in some cases in relatively nascent phases compared to the broader sort of how people bank every day. Um, but we're investing a tremendous amount of money and energy and time and resources into building those experiences on platforms like Eno or money coaching in cafes, because you know it's our point of view that those. Those experiences and those ways of interacting with your bank are better for the customer, um, and uh, and so you know the trick for us is finding the investment capacity to make those great experiences, the um, and 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 making the really hard judgment calls around well obviously promoting them and getting customers to use them, but also making really hard judgment calls about when do we when do we stop offering a particular type of product or service that might um, we just, that might just not be serving the customer's best interests, even if that's the way they've always done it. Yeah. That's the hardest part about my job, is when do you, when do you as, the, as the bank say, it's not in your best interest to keep doing this that way. You're paying a fee for something you don't need to pay a fee for, you could get it for free this over here, something like that. Um, and I think from a product perspective, that's the, that's the hardest part. Yeah. I, I think that for those of us in the room who are the, in some ways the educators as well, it's important for us to understand that, that too, that there, as we evolve as the banking system, as the financial services, as pro, uh, fi uh, personal finance professionals, as we evolve, our goal always has been to help other people get to the place where, we're, where we feel comfortable. And hopefully, as you've all pointed out, it doesn't need to take them, they don't need to spend 80 hours a week in front of a computer like yeah. some, some of us do. Well, and it doesn't even <laughs> have to be. money as, nerdness. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't even have to be as complicated as a lot of the technology stuff we're talking about, um, right? I mean, 90% of savings dollars in the United States are still with, um, 
with banks that that tend to offer very, very, very low savings rates. Yeah. And you know, there's a whole new set of banks, including Capital One, that in the last decade or so have come along and with a digital first um, business model and therefore a lot lower cost, cost in terms of physical locations, have been able to offer significantly better rates on savings. Um, and yet it's, you know, it's, that sort of direct banking model's been around, it's about 15 years now. Um, and still is only about 10% of deposits. And, and if you do the aggregate numbers, it's trillions of dollars in the United States that could be earning significantly more return. Um, and it would take nothing more than about five minutes to open the account and three more minutes to transfer the money. Right. It's it's just, that just gives you a sense for how hard it is, because I promise you those banks haven't been not trying. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying. <laughs> uh, it's just that consumers are so, um, We've talked about it, right? They're scared. They're 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 intimidated and scared by both technology, um, and and they want this to be background, so they they don't give it a lot of thought. Um, and waking customers up and and showing them that there are better options. That's that's what I, when I think about product, that's that I think that's our job. That's that's what we're kind of doing every day. So we have a couple more minutes left. I'll kind of open up to the audience. Does anyone have a question for the panelists about? Where Capital One is headed. <laughs> that list. You mentioned the tech debt, and <laughs> ACH needs to be shot in the head. Um, <laughs> you know, in Europe, they have real time transaction yeah. clearing in, in most of Europe. When are we going to get there? So, real time payments, are you familiar with TCH and, uh, and the real time payments initiative? I don't want to go too down in the, in the detail. I, I, well, the short answer is it's going to take time. We're, we're, we're talking a couple of years at least until you start to see. What, what you can read in the, you know, the, in the press about coming to real fruition. Um, that said, there are, some, there are some services today. So Zelle is, is the most prevalent one, which launched a year ago. Um, you know, all of the nation, you know, all of the larger banks in the country, and increasingly um, you know, the, the list of banks that are, that are part of Zelle is growing very quickly. So I would point to Zelle as real-time money movement that exists today. In, you know, in your banking app, if you bank with you know any one of the larger banks in the U.S., and then the broader initiative to sort of make a lot uh, more than just the P2P payments, but a lot of other types of money transfer, um, bill pay, for example, or deposit direct deposit from your from your from your employer. That's the one. Um, okay. Those things are going to come on the back of real time payments, which is an initiative that uh, that. You know, the entire banking industry and frankly the government is very much behind. It's tech debt takes takes a long time. Um, you know, I would say that you'll start to see I think it'll be a gradual thing where you'll see more and more sort of use cases coming online over the next starting in the next year, year and a half. But I think the the vision that 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 exists um, both in the industry and regulators um, is, is definitely to, to, to go down that path, for sure. Great, thank you. Anything else? How are you all looking at uh, regions that have less financial options and communities that have to deal with the unbanked? So I don't know if everyone heard, but you asked the, kind of basically the question, how are you dealing with or working with the communities that may be un underbanked or unbanked? There's a uh, there's a piece of that where we do have physical presence. Even the cafe model, certainly we have one or two cafes in most cities, so it's not um, not a huge reach. We try to go out in the community, so we partner with many different financial groups to try to come you know come to people to to train to teach. This Ready Set Bank that I mentioned earlier is a great way um, for people who aren't familiar with digital options to help to get them on board. And then we also do quite a lot of financial literacy. Um, uh, education. Um, I do think that there, you know, there are digital options, digital training options that we're working on and we're thinking about for a national footprint in places that are more remote without, um, without cafes or branches, but we don't quite have those yet. Yeah, one of the things I'd point to is at a really basic level, um, you know, most retail banks for a basic checking account will charge a fee if you don't have a certain minimum balance or have a direct deposit. And the communities that you're talking about tend not to have employers who do direct deposit and uh, tend not to keep as much in their, in their bank accounts uh, to reach the minimum. And so it becomes actually a very expensive proposition. So in a lot of cases, the unbanked or underbanked are so because 
not having a bank account is the logical, it's sort of like, you know, in the economic, it's, it's, it's the logical thing to do. It's the, it's, it's the smart thing to do because the cost of having a bank account just, just doesn't make sense. Um, again, back to my point about savings, the same thing is true on checking. It does require a willingness to engage in a much more digital experience, uh, but many of those same banks, including Capital One, offer no minimum balance um, free checking accounts. Uh, and, and why can we do that? Because we don't have, you know, it's the, it, we don't have the significant cost tied up in, you know, in a full branch network nationwide. And increasingly, we've built all the capabilities to be able to bank digitally. So um, I think even at its just very core product construct, um, you know, I think there is, I think there are increasingly options for those customers. Thank you. I think we're, we're out of time right now. Uh, I will say I'll, I'll continue to kind of pose the question to you all to think about ways that we can, I won't ask for, for responses right now, maybe we can discuss it later, but think about ways that we can connect these kinds of technologies to the communities that we serve, especially I, I think some of the underbanked and unbanked people in our communities, that we can really help them become more comfortable and safe with this idea of working with institutions, especially for, for that, you know, the, the technology level. Yeah. So, all right, well, thank you very much for, for joining you. us thank today. You. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.